Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Why? We got all types of snacks today. Bagels, taco salads. Take it away. These are downstairs. They're pretty fire. They're pretty fire, huh? There you go. It's pretty fire. Anyways, all right, so let's get started. Today we're going to talk about the stomach. Move on. So the stuff we, we talked about most of the upper gastrointestinal tract on, on Wednesday. All right, we talked about the oral cavity, the esophagus, the structure of the esophagus, and, and so on. And so now as we are consuming food, the next, the next structure we run, to, run into after the esophagus is the stomach, okay? And the stomach is a basically a, a an extension or an, a, a ballooning of the of the gastrointestinal tract of the alimentary canal, All right? So it kind of balloons out open. It, it, it serves as a sac for um, digestion. All right. There are four parts of the stomach, four different areas. We have the fundus which is over here, right? That's the top area. If we want to kind of draw the different parts. This is the fundus. Over here is the cardiac area. Most of that is the body. And then this is the pylorus region over in this area here, right? So cardiac, fundus, body, pylorus, okay? And why do we call it the cardiac region? Because that's right where the the heart is, all right? So most of the time when you have something called esophageal or gastroesophageal reflux, you end up with something more commonly known as acid reflux, or then is also heartburn, right? If it's temporary, if it happens all the time, heartburn. So what happens is right here at the, the um, esophageal, uh, the gastroesophageal junction, right? That area right in here, Okay, there's a, there's a muscle that, the muscle of the, of the alimentary canal is, in, is um, more developed and it actually forms a sphincter. Okay, so you have a sphincter here, we call a cardiac sphincter or the gastroesophageal sphincter. Okay, and you have a sphincter muscle at, in, at the boundary between the stomach and the small intestine. Both of those sphincters work to control entry and exit of the food that is in the stomach, okay? So some other points, anatomy of the stomach itself, okay? So we have, it's a rounded structure, and so we have what's called a lesser curvature or a greater curvature. So the greater curvature is, on, is lateral, it's on the outside. The lesser curvature is on the inside, is medial, okay? Um, just like we talked about on Wednesday, the stomach has four distinct layers of tissue, right? From mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and then the serosa on the outside. The muscular layer, okay? The muscularis layer of, of these tissues is much more developed in the stomach, in, right? So we said before, all of it has, all of the alimentary canal has a circular smooth muscle layer and a longitudinal smooth muscle layer. There's an additional smooth muscle layer in the stomach, which is an oblique layer. So it runs at an angle to the other two. Okay, so you can actually see the longitudinal layer, the circular layer, and then underneath that is the oblique layer. What does that have to do? What does that give the stomach more ability to do? More muscle means more damn, contraction, all right? More contraction, more motility, okay? More contraction in this case would aid in what? The extra contraction of the stomach would aid in what type of digestion? Mechanical digestion, 
Okay? And then, so the stomach churns and it moves things around, moves the food back and forth and mixes it all up. Okay? And then it mixes it with the gastric juice that's produced. Okay? There's gastric juice is like a collection of all the gastric secretions that are being produced by the cells of the stomach. On the inside of the stomach, there are folds. And those folds begin in the stomach of the mucosa. All right? Those folds begin in the stomach and they, they are continuous throughout the small intestine and the large intestine. Okay? The folds help to increase surface area. Those are the gastric folds. They are also known as... Anyone? Rugae. Okay? Those are the folds. Okay, questions on the general anatomy of the stomach. Okay, microscopically, within the mucosa, there are pits. Okay, this is a, called a gastric pit. Okay, most of the stomach and most of uh, the alimentary canal after, after the esophagus, the epithelium is a simple columnar epithelium. Okay, and then with that, in those rugae, there are this, there's these pits, right? Deep invaginations where the cells line the, the opening, and those cells produce many different things, okay? So this whole thing is a gastric pit, and then further at the end of the gastric pit is a gastric gland. And there are mul multiple types of cells that help and um, that are lining this gastric pit. Okay? At the surface, you have these mucus cells. What do we know about the stomach? What's the, what's the inside environment of the stomach like? It's acidic. It's acidic. Okay? So it has a very low pH. And so these surface cells, they produce a mucus, a mucine, a thick mucus that helps to protect them from the acidic pH. So up here, okay, your pH is somewhere around one. Is that conducive to cells living? No. All right, so they actually produces a thick mucus on the cell, on the cell surface that prevent that helps protect it. Okay? So protect those cells. So and also a little bit of uh, alkaline fluid that helps to neutralize the pH that's present in within the lumen of the stomach. As we move down the down deep and deeper into the pit, you end up with so you have those cells produce a protective layer. Then you end up with the mucus neck, cell, neck cells, all right? Mucus cells they secrete uh, another acidic fluid, another mucin, and then you end up with a couple. These two, these three cells are very important: parietal cells, chief cells, and G cells or enteroendocrine cells. Okay, I learned them as enteroendocrine cells. Okay, but they produce gastrin. Each of those cells, parietal cells, chief cells, and the, the enteroendocrine cells have a distinct function. Okay, in responding to the, the stomach having a bolus of food uh, present, these cells now start to secrete their different factors. The parietal cells okay, will produce hydrochloric acid that help to get the pH up, up to or down to pH close to one. Right? That's where the pH is, comes from, the low pH comes from. Chief cells produce two enzymes, pepsinogen and gastric lipase. Pepsinogen is an inactive form, okay, which then becomes activated in the presence of HCl2 Pepsin, and you all did pepsin digestion, right, in lab this week, okay? Did it work? How many of you say no? Yeah? It worked? Did it, was it purple or was it pink? Was it really pink? It was pretty close, okay? And then you have your enteroendocrine cells. They secrete gastrin into the blood. Okay, you notice the blood supply over here, they actually secrete gastrin. Gastrin is a hormone, okay? So it goes to the blood, and then it actually works back on the stomach, okay? And gastrin will help to 
increase the motility of the stomach. It will help to increase the secretions from these cells. Okay, so it's kind of like a positive, a little bit of a positive feedback mechanism, right? And then there's another way of, of stopping it from the outside. All right. So those cells, parietal cells, chief cells, and if you want to call them G cells or G cells or um, enteroendocrine cells, back to this one. Okay. Here's your parietal cells, okay, and here are your chief cells. So they're going to release this, and as they kind of run into this, they're going to start to produce active pepsin as it moves up. Okay, so here's the stomach pit, gastric pit and the lumen. Right, so you have your simple columnar epithelial cells, um, and then goes from there. Okay, <clears throat> and then your three layers of muscle on the outside within the, within the stomach. Okay, there is some lymph vessels that are within the pit as well, but they don't, they don't serve a large function in here. What do we know about the gastric juice? So, so tell me what you know about it so far. Low pH, right? What else? It contains what enzymes? Pepsin and gastric. Lipase. Okay, good. All right, we're, we're catching up. All right. What do you know about? What else do you know about the gastric juice? So it's got this. You know, and you all have vomited at one point. Knock on wood. Hopefully, okay. Well, for whatever reason, I don't care. Because oh, you were sick. You were sick. That's the right answer. Okay. So it's kind of it has. What does it do for, so when you consume the food, then what? So it has this normal, so when your stomach's empty, right? We have this gastric juice that's there, pH is one, okay? All right, fine. Now you have a piece of bread. What happens to the pH when you consume that bread? Does it change? Yes or no? What do you think? Yes. Yes, it does. It, whether it, it changes, whether it's for a short period of time or not, it changes. Okay, and there are receptors in the stomach that react to that change. They will notice that change in pH, and when that change occurs, when there's food present, that helps stimulate these secretions to bring up the change and release uh, to release uh, hydrogen ions and hydrochloric acid, and then release uh, different hormones and enzymes to digest that, okay? What else happens when you have a, when you eat, when you consume food to your stomach? We talked about Joey Chestnut on Wednesday. What does he do? He eats all those hot dogs and what happens to his stomach? stomach expands. His stomach expands, right? And we talked about chemoreceptors which would respond to that change in pH, and the baroreceptors will respond to the stretch in the stomach, okay? And then with the stretch in the stomach, that would, would stimulate the more of motility to turn the food around, okay? And then stimulate mechanical digestion, stimulate the release of these enzymes to, um, towards chemical digestion. Where those parietal cells are, okay? So this is the formation of hydrochloric acid, right? So you have a sodium potassium pump is involved in this, okay? So sodium potassium pump, is gonna, or, or, or hydrogen potassium pump, is gonna pump hydrogen ions out, right? And they're gonna fuse with chlorine. And all of that actually comes from, originates from the bicarbonate that's present, right, in, the related to the bicarbonate that's present in <coughs> the blood. So, water is split, First, water is split to produce a hydrogen ion, and the OH ion then combines with CO2 to form bicarbonate, which is released in the blood. And that, in, in response, chlorine is taken out of the blood, through the cells, and then released into the stomach. Those two then combine to produce hydrochloric acid, which then 
lowers the pH of the stomach. Right? So it's not like these parietal cells are pumping out hydrochloric acid. Okay? They're pumping out the ions, which then interact later on outside of the cell to, pro to produce hydrochloric acid. Because hydrochloric acid is not conducive to cellular life. Okay? Back here, and I saw kind of. So here are some of the gastric secretions we're going to be looking at or we're talking about. All right, so hydrochloric acid is released from the parietal cells. The gastric, right, the G cells are producing gastrin. All right, they're producing gastrin into the blood. And the chi cells are producing pepsinogen, which then, as it moves, as pepsin pepsinogen is released here, and there's a timing that occurs, okay? So all of this is gonna be released into the gastric pit, right? Pepsinogen is in, a, in an inactive form and only becomes active after it, re it passes past the parietal cells. So if I went through the gastric pit, okay? And then here's your denatured proteins. Why do proteins denature in the stomach? Temperature, what else? In the stomach, what are we talking about? Hmm? The acidity, the pH. So that helps, that aids in protein digestion, okay? So denatured proteins, and now the pepsin works and breaks it up into these little chunks, okay? Smaller chunks. Is there any absorption that occurs in the stomach? No, not much. There are some, there are a few substances that are absorbed through the stomach. Aspirin is one of them. Ethanol is another one, right? But very few are absorbed through, this, through, through the stomach, okay? So really, the big function of the stomach is a little bit in terms of chemical digestion of proteins and, and fats, but one of the biggest, the biggest function of the stomach is mechanical digestion, okay? The stomach with the extra muscle churns and mixes food. That bolus of food that was consumed comes in through the cardiac sphincter, empties into the stomach, and then changes pH, okay? So now you get con contraction of the muscle, churning of the muscles of the stomach to mix the food with that gastric juice, and it can turn, and now pushes the, the, that, what's now called chyme, right, towards the pyloric, into the pyloric region of the stomach against the pyloric sphincter, okay? It produces a pressure gradient, Right, which then forces this open. It opens and some chyme moves out past the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum of the small intestine. Okay? And as that ha happens, the sphincter clo closes and retral propulsion occurs, means that this closes and forces this food back and then uh, chyme back towards the middle of the stomach and around again. What does that retral propulsion aid in? It aids in a further mixing of the chyme, all right? So everything is really, really well mixed by the time it gets out of the stomach, okay? <clears throat> Question. So now, there are the stomach, like I said, is a holding bag for partially digested food. It has these what's called pacemaker cells, cells that help regulate its activity. They regulate the activity of the smooth muscle and regulate how often food is passed from the stomach to the small intestine and how much, activity, or how much muscle contraction ongo. Okay? So the force of contraction is regulated by both nervous reflexes, we'll talk about in a second, and hormones, and there, it, this occurs in three phases. All right, the first phase is the, is the cephalic phase. If this class was at 11, right, when I, this is one of the probably the biggest concern of my 11 o'clock labs on Tuesdays and Thursdays, is oh, I'm hungry, and they start talking about food at 11:30, right, when your circadian rhythm is saying oh, giving you a a, a response of it's time to eat, it's time to eat. Okay, 
And what happens by about 1.30, 2 o'clock, when they're almost ready to get out of lab, how's their stomach feel? What's their stomach doing? Put yourself in their situation. What's it, what's it like? Emma, you have class at 11. It hurts, right? Sometimes you might have a little growling going on, right? The thought of food, in this case, stimulated by your circadian rhythm, the fact that you eat every day, lunchtime, right between 11 and 2, stimulates this cephalic phase, right? It stimulates the medulla, right, to, to increase vagal response to the stomach. And the thought of, uh, thought of food initiates this reflex. <coughs> that leads to increased motility. The stomach growls. Oh, I'm hungry. You didn't know you were hungry other than the fact that your, your rhythm is telling you that. Okay? So, cephalic phase. All right? But it initiates the beginning of this. Things are starting to happen. And now, once you consume food, right, you end up going from the cephalic phase into the gastric phase. Okay? When you, you think about it, how many, of you ever, how many of you have ever been to a restaurant and had a really long wait and you were hungry? Right? And you're waiting there and you're waiting there. What happens to your stomach? Oh my God, it's killing me. Because you thought about food, there's a bunch of smells around you, you see everyone else's food, where's my food, where's my food? My stomach hurts. You are stuck in this cephalic phase. Now your food comes and you start to eat. Now you've moved on to the gastric phase. The bolus of food enters the stomach and the stomach stretches, okay? There's a change in pH as the food enters and increases pH from one to whatever. There's a presence of protein, right? And now in, in this case, because gastrin has now been released in response to that cephalic phase, increased motility, increased hydrochloric acid production, and then it delays emptying, okay? Why, does it want to do, why is it important that the gastrin increase motility of the stomach, the churning, but delays emptying? So the chyme's not moving into the small intestine. What does that help? What does that aid in? Oh, mechanical digestion. Mechanical digestion. Okay. So that that mixing occurs and you get adequate mixing of, of the chyme that's present, all right? And now, as all of that motility has occurred and the chyme has been pushed in towards the pylorus, and now some of it has exited the stomach into the duodenum, you enter the, di the intestinal phase. So chyme enters the small intestine, and the stimulus then, so... The stimulus, as it moves to the small intestine, actually reduces motility and the secretory activity of the stomach. So some moves through and then kind of slows things down in the stomach. And then some more moves through and slows things down. What does that help ensure that the stomach, the food, doesn't go too quickly to the small intestine, number one, and also helps ensure that allows the stomach extra time to mechanically digest and allow the chemicals chemical digestion to occur, okay? And there's other hormones that are involved in this, cholecystokinin and secretin also feed, feed back into that process, All right? So three phases of, the, of regulating the digestive processes in the stomach, okay? But now food, or say, let's call it chyme because that's what it is. Chyme transfers, is pushed from the stomach well mixed, partially digested. It's pushed from the stomach into the small intestine, to the duodenum, right? And now we reach the lower gastrointestinal tract, which is really two parts of, a, of the alimentary canal, the small intestine and the large intestine, and several, a couple, or a few accessory organs, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, okay? So, the small intestine has three distinct areas, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, okay? The duodenum begins at the pylorus, right? There's a, a, a dis, 
let's say, non-distinct transition from the duodenum to the jejunum. Most of your absorption occurs in the jejunum and then the ileum. The ileum ends at the ileocecal valve, another sphincter, which then begins uh, the portion of the, of the large intestine called the cecum. All right, and then you have an ascending colon. That's the large intestine. It's ascending because it's moving towards the top. Transverse, which goes right across from the right side to the left side, right across, right above your belly button. Okay, and then the, the descending colon, right on your left side, and then the sigmoid colon towards the middle, and the anus, a rectum and anus expels waste. Okay, the liver is on your right side, right upper quadrant, right? The pancreas is actually retroperitoneal and behind the stomach. Okay, what do I need? What do I mean by retroperitoneal? Retro means what? Back, right? Back. So retroperitoneal is it means in back of the peritoneum. Peritoneum is the lining of the thoracic cavity. This is actually outside of the peritoneum, right? And there's a couple different organs that are retroperitoneal, including the pancreas, the kidneys, uh, parts of the stomach, the esophagus, etc. Okay, the small intestine has those four layers. Okay, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosal layers. Within this, there are distinct structural changes that are important for the, its function. Okay? So, throughout the digestive system, there are structural anatomical structures that help to increase surface area. Okay? <laughs> the folds in the stomach help increase surface area. And likewise, you have folds in the small intestine. You actually have circular folds. So imagine that you have a tube, and inside that tube is kind of a rippled tube. Okay, you've all seen the kind of crinkly straws, the bendy straws. Think about it like that. That's what the inside of the small intestine looks like. Okay? And those circular folds, those bumps, they act as speed bumps to kind of slow the chyme as it's moving through the small intestine and also increase surface area as it moves through the small intestine. So you have those, those folds, and then those, here's, you see this circular fold, and each of that, that fold has folds, or ripples, okay? Each of these folds here are, micro, are villi, okay? Are villi. So this is a circular fold, and then the food will be moving in this direction, okay, and it kind of goes over this speed bump and trickles down, and all of this increase in surface area allows for digestion to occur, okay? Those are your intestinal villi. Now, each one of those villi are covered, so if we were to look at this right here, okay, that villus is actually covered by epithelial cells, columnar epithelial cells that have microvilli on them and have extensions that look like this okay whoa that look like that so this cell that's on the top there is a epi columnar epithelial cell with a nucleus and at the and at the top it has microvilli okay so the circular there's folds on the folds of the circular folds or the circular folds have folds called villi, and those villi have folds at the, at the apical surface called microvilli. And again, that is your brush border, and that helps to increase surface area. And here, right, that's your brush border. This increased surface area, and this is lots of enzymes are produced there, okay? Within the villus, okay, so here's kind of where things are. You're looking at the villus, they have a couple different cells. You'll see goblet cells that are, pro are produced or spaced throughout. Goblet cells produce what? Mucus, OK? 
okay? So they produce mucin to help protect the cells, and then you have the simple columnar epithelium with the microvilli. These are your absorptive cells. They're going to move nutrients from the digestive food into the blood or the lacteals, okay? <clears throat> okay, here's enteropeptidase. Here's a unicellular gland, produces an enzyme, all right? And you have more enteroendocrine cells here within the, <clears throat> within the small intestine as well, which will produce hormones. Here's a picture of microvilli. Scanning electron micrograph of microvilli, so you can see the, this is a villus, the top of the villus, right, of top of the uh, epithelial cell that's on top of the villus, and you see the brush border cells that are present. Questions? What's the main function of the small intestine? Absorption, okay? Absorption. So as of right now, what else has occurred? We've digested what? Let's start with food as it's consumed. Where does digestion begin? Of what begins? In the mouth, all right? What starts being digested in the mouth? Carbohydrates. And then the food is swallowed, goes to the stomach. Now what? Hmm? Mechanical More mechanical digestion. What about chemical digestion that occurs in the stomach? Proteins, Proteins and a little bit of lipids. Okay? Now food then moves from the stomach to the small intestine. Now what? Now what? Okay, so now we have to get into, we haven't talked, we talked a little, a little bit about the main function of the small intestine, which is absorption. It is, the main function is not necessarily to promote, to produce, they do produce enzymes on the brush border that will help break down the rest of food and help absorption, but a lot of those enzymes come from somewhere else. And they come from accessory, the, the accessory organs, okay? The liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, okay? So what you have here is the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, they're kind of interact or they're kind of attached in a, in a certain way, okay? And they are um, directly associated with the small intestine. So as food moves from the stomach, which would be, you know, the stomach would be here, okay? So this would be the stomach. As food moves from the pyloric sphincter, right, into the small intestine, when food moves, uh, the chyme moves out of the small, uh, out of the stomach into the small intestine. What is the pH? High or low? Low. Okay. So as it's moving to the small intestine, now we have a difference in pH again. Is that important? It's like a signal. Okay. The low pH of the chyme moving out of the stomach into the small intestine actually stimulates the secretion of pancreatic enzymes and bile, okay? So, and then also an alkaline fluid from this valve, okay? You call a common bile duct, you'll see it in a second. So here we have the gallbladder, the liver. Liver produces bile, and its bile is stored in the gallbladder, and as Time moves from the stomach into the small intestine, you get release of these pancreatic juice and bile together. They come out of this, whoops, come out of this little valve right here. Okay, there's actually that one and there's another one right up at the end of that arrow. Okay? And they release alkaline fluid to help neutralize the pH, and they also release a lot of pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic enzymes, such as lipase, amylase, um, peptidases, etc. Okay? And then, and then 
the gallbladder releases bile. And what does bile do? Emulsification. Emulsification. Emulsifies fat. Hmm? All the ladders? <laughs> or gallbladder? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay? So, these accessory organs, although they're accessory, they play a big role in digestion. Okay? And then the rest of, so these pancreatic enzymes, bile, the, they will break down food, and then the rest of the enzymes come from the brush border cells that will break down do the rest of digestion, okay? So here's the, the duct system itself. So you have your main pancreatic duct, all right? So bile is produced where? Where is it produced? In the liver, right? So bile up here, you know, from the liver, goes through these left and right hepatic ducts. And it goes down the common bile duct, Okay, they, these, these two merge, or the cystic duct merges with um, the left and right hepatic ducts to form the common bile duct, right? So that's this one right here. And that then fuses right here at this uh, valve, the hepatopancreatic ampulla with the hepatic pancreatic sphincter, <coughs> right? So there's this valve that's right here, okay, valve. So the common bile duct goes down. Now, the liver is always producing bile, okay? But it's not, it's not continuously released into the small intestine, okay? So it backs up, and whatever's backed up is stored in the gallbladder. And the gallbladder releases it as necessary, okay? Then the pancreas, the acinar cells of the pancreas, not, right, these are like alpha and uh, delta cells. Delta, yeah, I had to remember that, right? The beta cells produce insulin. These two produce enzymes, okay? There's gamma cells as well. So they produce the enzyme in the pancreatic juice, which is kind of collected into this main pancreatic duct and then released into the small intestine when stimulated. There is an accessory pancreatic duct in case that one gets blocked, but the main one's the predominant one, okay? So then your bile and your pancreatic juices enter the duodenum, right, at the, what was the major duodenal pap papilla, <coughs> papilla, okay? All of those enzymes then mix with the food, with the chyme, and undergoes, continues to undergo some mechanical digestion through segmentation within the small intestine and mixing those enzymes to produce, uh, to aid in chemical digestion, okay? The liver itself is multi-lobed, okay? It's covered with uh, some connective tissue which actually goes into and around the liver, right? The liver has a, some properties of regeneration to it, all right? So um, you can take a portion out of it and it will, some of it will grow back. Okay, so you have a left, right, there's like a couple different lobes. In this case, you're seeing the left and right lobe, right, and the, the gallbladder is actually under the inferior surface in the depression within the liver. Okay. Here's what it looks like underneath. Okay, and you see the, the ducts and the, and the hepatic arteries and veins that go in and out of the, <clears throat> the liver, what's called the porter hepatis, where, where the, the blood vessels go in and out. Okay, so here's the do, b common bile duct, hepatic artery, hepatic vein, hepatic portal vein. This is the hepatic vein, right? Uh, which would come into here and then go into the, into the vena cava. Okay? And you can see, I'm not going to ask you to know the lobes of this. I don't care. It's multi-lobed. The connective tissue separates it into lobes and then into, we actually separate the different parts of the lobes into lobules, 
right? So there's a separation that occurs. And so just like you have lobar arteries in your lungs, right? There's a separation all right, that happens in the liver as well, all right? The ligamentosum venosum, what's that? <coughs> that is the remnant of the ductus venosum, venosus, that is present in the fetal circulation, right? So that closes up and becomes a ligament within the liver because that would bypass the liver to bring oxygenated blood to mix with the vena cava, right? Yeah. So this is what lobules look like, okay? They are structured, they have, they have, they have, they have this hexagonal structure. And like, they are straight up hexagons. I don't know why, for whatever reason, but when you look at them under a microscope, you can actually draw the hexagons like this. And each one of the hexagons has a center point, okay? We call a central vein, all right? So what happens is that blood comes from the hepatic portal artery, or excuse me, the hepatic portal vein from the intestine brings all the, the nutrient-rich, oxygen-poor blood and empties it here in this sinusoid, in this lobule. So you see on the outside what we call a portal triad. One, two, three. It's a hepatic arteriole. It's a vein that is branched off of the hepatic portal vein. And it's a lymphatic capillary, a lymphatic vessel. So we have an artery, a vein, and a, and a lymphatic vessel. Remember, this vein is actually coming off of the hepatic portal vein. So this is bringing blood from the intestines to the liver. And the blood then pools in this lobule. And it is cleaned by the cells that are around it. Hepatocytes, liver cells. Okay? And then it collects and empties into the central vein. And then that it then leaves through the hepatic vein to the vena cava, to the right atrium. All right? So this sinusoid is very important. All right? Central vein. And you have this... Lymphatic vessel is actually, is actually a bile vessel, right, because bile is produced here. To see it on my, a microscope, you look, this is a liver H&E. So you can see that all the hepatocytes are kind of arranged in columns. The open areas are sinusoids, and these are sheets of hepatocytes. In different areas of the liver, you would actually see it look like lines, like the hepatocytes are just lined up like this emanating out from the central vein, okay? So you get a production of bile and then the, cl the cleaning of toxins and material from the portal vein blood, all right? So you have this, that, this vessel right here, these three things, one, two, three, that is your portal triad, okay? One is hepatic arterial. Two is a hepatic portal venule or vein. And number three is a bile vessel. Okay, bile vessel. That's your portal triad. Okay, questions on that? Can you guys read that? It out loud. Okay, there's your portal triad again. All right, here's one, two, three. Okay. And this is actually showing you the flow of blood as well. Okay, so it comes from, from the hepatic portal vein, blood comes in and actually goes through and, pu and pulls through this. These sinusoids are important. They're going to produce bile, empties into there, hepatic artery, all right, and you can see it actually runs right into, and then they have these sinusoids, these, the blood pools in these sinusoids and allows toxins and everything to be moved out uh, due to diffusion differences, right, and active transport within the hepatocytes. And this is what it looks like under microscope, okay? 
So you have some interlobar connective tissue, hepatic artery, hepatic vein, and then this little guy right there, that's your uh, branch of the bile duct. So this is your portal triad, one, two, three, and then hepatocytes all around it. You see some sinusoids, some blank area where the blood will pool together. <clears throat> okay. So your hepatic portal system, blood is going to go from the small intestine where absorption is going to occur, right? From the small intestine and some from the large intestine, from the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric arteries, okay? They're going to, uh, not arteries, excuse me, mesenteric veins, superior and inferior. Mesenteric veins are going to fuse with the splenic vein to become the hepatic portal vein. That goes to the liver. Blood pools is through the triads, collected through the central vein, okay? And then leaves out, is drained by the right and left hepatic veins, and then goes to the uh, vena cava, inferior vena cava before going to the right atrium, okay? So this is your basic scheme of the hepatic portal system, all right? So we'll say portal system here, okay? In the stomach or in the intestines, blood, arterial blood comes in, goes through the capillary bed, provides oxygen and nutrients to the, those cells, but it also picks up nutrients and toxins are absorbed, okay? That, instead of going back directly into the venous system, it then is shunted through the portal vein to the liver, hepatocytes remove nutrients, okay? And toxins leave and some nutrients stay, whatever they need to do, okay? Performs cleansing and now the, the rest, the clean blood then is emptied by the port from the liver, by the hepatic vein into the inferior vena cava and return to the venous blood circulation. That's the portal system. Questions on that? Okay, so we covered liver. We'll cover pancreas on, on Monday. Um, we'll go through some more enzymes and some, some more hormone secretions that regulate uh, digestion. If you have questions, email me or come by office hours.